Olivet Nazarene University began as an idea, a big idea, a dream, really, in the minds and hearts of just a handful of Eastern Illinois families during the first decade of the last century. As those folks stood on the threshold of the 20th century, they began to sense winds of change all around them. The world was changing, and it was changing in fundamental ways, ways that had never happened in the long history of humanity. Electricity, for example. The night was becoming day. Industry was being revolutionized by electricity, and homes and streets were illuminated. And the automobile was making its first appearance, signaling a wholesale change in American society. And don't get me wrong, there was even talk of people flying. The world was changing in fundamental ways. But it was not just the ways of technology and industry. The world was also changing in the way people thought. For example, in 1905, Albert Einstein published his first general theory of relativity that began to turn our understanding of the physical world upside down. And in Vienna, a psychiatrist named Sigmund Freud began to write and talk about human personality in ways that were new. His views of human sexuality sent a kind of shiver throughout the world. About the same time, a British scientist and former clergyman named Charles Darwin boarded a little boat called the Beagle on the west coast of South America and made the relatively short journey to a place called the Galapagos Islands. His observations there led to the later publication of his book, The Origin of Species. Darwin's theories, Freud's work, Einstein's contributions, along with many others, continued to reshape how people viewed the world. It was during that same period of time that a small group of dedicated men and women, humble folks really, they were farmers and businessmen, good people who recognized that the world their children were going to inherit was a much different world than they had known. So they got this idea to establish a university, a first-rate university where their children and others could prepare for a world that had not yet arrived. With a great measure of faith and sacrifice, they began to investigate what would it take to start a college. And they started to raise money and dream the dream. Then in the fall of 1907, in a little town called Georgetown, Illinois, about 90 miles south of our present campus, what we know today as Olivet Nazarene University began. There was only one teacher named Mary Nesbitt, one classroom, and just a handful of students. But it was a beginning. During that first year in 1907-1908, the founders of the school pooled their resources, mortgaged farms, sold property, dipped into their savings to purchase two large farms that were adjacent to each other just south of Georgetown. Once the property had been secured, they began to lay out an elaborate plan. At the heart of the property, on the frontage of Illinois Route 1 and a rail line called the Interurban, they envisioned the building of a university. To the north of the campus, a series of streets were laid out where fine homes were being built and sold to help finance the university. At the south, a large working farm was established to help provide income and produce. And then at the back part of the property, there were coal reserves, and coal was still very much in demand. So the plan was to sell the rights to the coal. I've seen the drawings from that era of the university. In fact, I've visited the site. It was a grand vision. Soon, the new town out on Illinois Route 1 began to take shape, and it was named Olivet, Illinois. And the construction of the campus began as well. The following year, the school moved from Georgetown to the new property at Olivet. Now, Illinois farmland is very fertile, almost anything one plants will grow. So with prayer and sacrifice and lots of determination, they planted this idea of a university. And sure enough, it began to take root and started to grow. Students came from throughout Illinois and across the line into Indiana and all the way over to Ohio. 
brick buildings started to take shape on the campus and houses were being built and the farm operation was in full swing. It was a wonderful beginning. By the end of the first five years, nearly 200 students had enrolled at Olivet and the founding families were nearly overtaken with the responsibility of caring for the school while at the same time keeping their farms and businesses going. So in 1912, they offered their young school to a brand new Christian denomination called the Church of the Nazarene. That was a match made in heaven. The young denomination suddenly had a college and news of the school began to circulate. Throughout the teens, the school continued to grow. New buildings were being added and the school started to mature. By 1926, Olivet got to a place where it could not keep up with its financial obligations. And finally, it had to declare bankruptcy. Once that happened, the court stepped in and took legal possession of all the assets. The court decided to sell all the assets of the university and pay the creditors, which would mean in turn that the university that had such a great start would in fact close. The day was set for a public auction on the courthouse steps in Danville, Illinois. A large crowd gathered. Some had come hoping to buy the farmland. Others wanted the coal rights. Others were hoping to buy the remaining houses at a deep discount. When the appointed time came, a court official read the report from the judge and began to start the bidding process. Well, it was just then that a rather remarkable thing happened. A tall, relatively young man with a strong voice, standing at the back of the crowd, spoke up saying, I bid, and he gave an amount for everything. Such a bid startled the crowd. No one was prepared to buy everything. Some wanted the coal, some wanted equipment or houses, but no one could match that single bid. And so, the assets of the school were sold to one man. His name was T.W. Willingham. Dr. Willingham had been a member of the Board of Trustees at the college and was particularly distraught when the bankruptcy came. He immediately began a one-man crusade to save the school. He went to everybody he knew saying, we've got to save Olivet. And sure enough, People took second mortgages, they sacrificed again, and got enough money together to buy the school. Dr. Willingham was elected president of Olivet the next day. He served with distinction as Olivet's president for the next 13 years, bringing his financial capabilities to the school right at a pivotal time. Under Dr. Willingham's leadership and the support of a growing constituency, Olivet continued to grow and develop even as the Great Depression settled like a heavy, dark blanket across the nation. Though things were still tight, the future of the school seemed promising. But then it happened. Tragedy struck late on a Saturday night in October of 1939. Fire broke out on the campus at Olivet. Olivet, being a very small town, did not have a fire department. So village folks, along with faculty, staff, and students, carried water and sent word to Danville for help. But by the time the Danville Fire Department got there, it was simply too little, too late. As the sun rose that Sunday morning, the campus lay before them, mostly in ashes. In shock, faculty, staff, and students stood in a limp circle, watching their hopes, their dreams, their sacrifice still smolder. I've talked to some who were there that night. They told me about watching the fire. In fact, one man told me about hearing pianos dropping through the floors of a building, floor by floor. It was a dramatic moment. How could the school ever come back from such a devastating loss? The Great Depression still was in force, and by this time, war clouds were gathering in Europe. What would become of Olivet. Then, just two days later, another remarkable thing happened. It didn't happen on the campus of Olivet. In fact, it didn't happen in Illinois at all. It happened 1,000 miles or more away. It happened in Boston, Massachusetts. 
On that morning, a businessman did what he did every morning as he left home. He stopped at a little corner cafe, got a cup of coffee, and a morning edition of the Boston Globe. As he was reading the paper on this particular morning, his eyes fell on a little story. Really just a headline with a couple of sentences, probably put in the paper to fill the column. He paused a moment, then turned the page and went on about his business. But later that morning, that headline came back to him. So he got up from his desk, stepped out of his office, walked down the hall and into a large filing cabinet room. He found a filing drawer marked I for Illinois and began to work his way back through the files, finally pulling out a folder marked Olivet College, Olivet, Illinois. The insurance company where he worked in Boston had an insurance policy on that campus in Olivet. The insurance money would not be nearly enough to rebuild the campus, but still there was hope. But maybe the most remarkable part of the story is that as the man in Massachusetts was going through the Illinois file looking for Olivet College, he came to another folder marked St. Viator's College, Bourbonnet, Illinois. St. Viator's College was started in the mid-1800s in Bourbonnet by the Roman Catholic Church and it was a very fine school. It had prospered for many years, but finally closed during the Great Depression. So I want you to get the picture. Here is a man standing a thousand miles away, two days after the fire, with the scent of smoke still in the air. He is standing there in the office. In one hand, he has a college without a campus, and in the other hand, a campus without a college. The insurance company made a proposal to settle the insurance claim for the Olivet property by offering the school the campus in Bourbonnet at a much reduced rate. An Olivet delegation made the trip to Bourbonnet to look over the campus and decided that taking this offer was in fact the thing to do. So the school limped along, so to speak, during the last part of that year at Olivet, Illinois. But then in the summer of 1940, moved from Olivet to Bourbonnet. At the time, it was just 40 acres and four major buildings. But one of the church leaders who visited the campus said, I don't know how you'll fill this place up. It seems so grand. Chapman Hall, Burke Administration Building, Miller Business Center, and Bircher Gymnasium. Those are the four original buildings from the St. Viator's campus. When Olivet arrived in Bourbonnet in 1940, it marked the beginning of a new day. The school moved from the cornfields of central Illinois to a fully developed campus within striking distance of Chicago, a world-class city. The school quickly began to regroup and find itself again, and in just a few years it paid off the remaining debt on the new campus. And by the time World War II ended and the soldiers were coming back, getting ready to go to college, Olivet was positioned for growth and further development. Olivet experienced a steady pace of progress and expansion throughout the next several decades, all the way through 2007, its centennial year. I remember saying at the 100 year mark, we have stood the test of time. Throughout the good years, the tough years, the bankruptcy, the fire, the wars, the Great Depression, and all the rest, Olivet not only survived, it began to thrive and mature as a university. As I look back across the history of Olivet, the one thing that remained steady throughout all the ups and downs was the university's clear sense of mission. It is the mission of the university that defines who we are and sets this campus apart from any other campus in America. The mission of Olivet Nazarene University is to provide an education with a Christian purpose. We seek to provide high quality academic instruction for personal development, career and professional readiness, and the preparation for individuals for lives of service to God and humanity. Those winds of change in the first decade of the last century have now become whirlwinds of change. The world in which the university came of age has in many ways disappeared and has been replaced by a fast paced, highly technical post-Christian world. Thus, the values that gave rise to Olivet are more important today than ever before. I'm convinced 
that the most significant days for Olivet Nazarene University are just ahead of us. If the world ever needed a school like Olivet, surely it is now.